Hello and welcome to Important Learning, the home for the best stories live at CUNY Logistics University. Navigate with us through the life experience of our students and let yourself be inspired by their challenges and their achievements. Here we go. Our guest today has all the techie knowledge to hack your Instagram or train a robot to make your bed in the mornings, but he actually has decided to put his skills to work in a much more ethical and much more productive way, which is researching and teaching at KLU. Welcome, Henrik Leopold, to Important Learning. Thanks. Happy to be here. Professor Leopold is a computer scientist who achieved his doctor title with a PhD in information systems from the Humboldt University in Berlin, the same university that hosted celebrities like Albert Einstein and Karl Marx. No pressure, right? <laughs> and after moving around in Vienna and Amsterdam, Professor Leopold landed at KLU in 2019 to continue his research and of course, to help KLU students to become the future of the digital world. It is precisely them, the students of KLU, who have indirectly invited Hendrik today to Important Learning because during the last graduation, he was awarded as the best teacher of 2022, elected by our KLU students. So Hendrik, can I say Hendrik, right? Professor yes, Leopold please. sounds a little bit <laughs> too much for the podcast. Let's start with the easy question. How do you take this award and why do you think the student body selected you this year? Yeah, I really appreciate the award, obviously. So I think uh, teaching is something where you invest a lot of time and uh, you really, I mean, the student recognition appreciation is the only thing that you can get for it. So I truly appreciate the award. Um, so why did I get it? Well, I um, if I read the... Uh, evaluations from the students, I think they really appreciate that I do make an effort of explaining things well, which sounds a bit trivial, I feel. But uh, I think, well, I teach technical concepts and people, well, the level of knowledge is not very homogeneous, right? So some people know a lot, some people know a little, for some people it's completely new. So uh, you have to break down things for different, simply for different levels of knowledge. And they seem to appreciate that. They also seem to appreciate that I'm excited. I am, right? I think it's exciting what I teach. And yeah, I think that's that's basically it. So being passionate about your work basically got you the most basic award, which is I teach, I teach well. <laughs> Maybe, yes. But I think it's, it is important to be passionate, right? I mean, if, if I think it's boring what I teach, what can the students think about it? Let's tackle the basics first. Uh, what do you teach at KLU? So I teach technical courses, so mostly related to programming, databases, data science. So it's, uh, yeah, it's basically the technical part of the education at KLU. And of all these classes that you're teaching, both in bachelor's and master's level, uh, what is the class that you like the most to teach and why? I, of course, like teaching all my courses. But if you ask me what I like the most, I do like the data science course because that's the topic I'm really uh, into. And I think it's very valuable for the students in the master's. And at the same time, it's uh, not a course they have elected. So it's something that is imposed on them. And, and maybe not all of them, you know, are happy about this in the first place. Um, but it seems that most of them are happy afterwards. So I think this is something that I find exciting to teach them something they probably did not choose, but in the end really like. And that's that's really an exciting part to, I'm excited about the topic and make them excited about the topic. And I really believe that's an essential part of the education to learn about these things. That is key and is um, clearly appreciated by your students that they maybe start the classes not knowing very well what's going to happen. Uh, but at the end of the year, it seems like they're very happy with what they have learned and how they have learned it. So that is definitely very interesting and very important. Um, there is teaching, there is researching. And we want to also highlight another task that you have gotten yourself involved into at KLU, which is being the head of the Equality and Diversity Office. Tell us a little bit what this entitles. What is it? So basically the EDO is a, so the Equality and Diversity Office. We are a committee. We are a number of people who chose to contribute to this committee. And yeah, we are 
trying to yeah trying to analyze and prove and dedicate our time to topics of diversity and these are different aspects right we're an international place um, and there are many topics that are important in that regard we want everybody here to feel comfortable uh, we would like to create an environment that is that is positive for for everyone who works here studies here and well once in a while there are things that we feel should be addressed on and these are things we're discussing we're trying to develop measures plans to improve on these things this is i think essentially uh, what we do and um yeah i think it, i'm happy to be part of this even though you know i'm a i'm a white man um but what i personally feel that it's important that also those who are not affected directly by certain types of discrimination invest in it and try to you know contribute in a way yeah at the end of the day nobody chooses what race what nationality you're born in and i think it's a work for everybody to get together and get united with diversity no matter where you're coming from at klu we are very committed to create always a safe and respectful space where everybody feels welcome and we normally say that our diversity is our power And I think we really mean it um, in every class, but also uh, structuring a university that has this safe environment for everyone. Moving on, we are going to go back to your teaching, but I would like to backtrack a little bit in your life. Let's look at the 17-year-old Henrik. Normally, 17-year-olds are not thinking, oh, when I grow old, I'm going to be a professor in the university. So how... Did this journey start for you? When and why did you decide, okay, I'm going to pursue an academia career? Yeah. So when I was 17, it was more a, a choice of the topic, right? So I was excited about computer science when I was 17. I was excited about programming. And at that point, well, I didn't think about the the career that might come or not come out of this when i when i went on so uh, I, i did decide to study uh, computer science or information systems um and yeah well then at some point you have to decide what what kind of job do you take right so after my master's i decided to do a phd and after the phd i decided well but really interesting to do a postdoc and then i i got this interesting assistant professor position in amsterdam but it was more of a natural thing it evolved right so it was not so now i'm here now i'm going to academia and i'm going to stay here i think at any given moment of time i could have said and i can be honest these thoughts happen right so uh, will i will i stay or will i do something else and well i stayed uh, and i'm here now so uh, it, it happened and i think i'm very happy to to be a uh, part of the academic life and community but it for me personally i do not recall a moment of time where i sort of decided this is going to be it for the rest of my life it was not a revelation it was just like a setup of decisions in the moment and they brought you here and now yes. all the students at KLU are benefiting from all these little <laughs> decisions in your life yes Um, and another thing is that entering into academia doesn't seem an easy task. Um, it might sound cliche, but uh, still very much looks like you guys are like the top of the class, the super smart kids. You know, not everybody has a PhD kind of thing. Do you really have to be the number one in class to pursue a career in academia? Or is that really approachable to all kinds of people? So I think it really depends on the specific subject, but I think you need to like specific things. So I'm a computer scientist, so I spend a lot of time doing my PhD. I spend time programming. I spend time, yeah, inventing sounds big, but that's what we did. We invented innovative algorithms for solving problems. You have to implement those algorithms. You have to sit in front of a computer. You have to like coding. You have to like failing while coding and you have to like writing things down afterwards so these are specific things you have to like it's a combination of things you know there are people that like coding but they don't like writing and there are people that like writing but they wouldn't like you know like this type of uh, computer science work so in my area you have to be interested in these things and well then this is a combination of certain interests i feel and then i think you can go for it certainly you have to have skill or a skill set but it doesn't 
mean that you have to be the best of the class in every possible subject. I, I don't think that's necessary. I would say that important skill is patience because you guys are many hours focused in the same topic and uh, kind of like looking at it from all the perspectives. So if you get bored fast, maybe that's not for you. I agree. So you have to be patient, but maybe, you know, patience is also, so I think if you really like it, then maybe you don't even have to be that patient because if you're just super excited about doing something then it takes a long time so then you don't feel you know don't, you don't feel that you have to be patient it's just like okay i like doing that and it's fine that it takes a while but i agree i mean patience is something that that you definitely need because oftentimes things don't work out the first time and sometimes they don't work out the second or third time especially when you're trying to solve technical problems you might end up failing over and over and over again and that's something definitely i agree you have to deal with so we're gonna add persistence to the equation <laughs> yes <laughs> um we tend to see professors uh, in their teaching jobs inside the university sometimes it's difficult to picture any of you like out of the classroom how is the life of a researcher, a professor outside of the classroom? How yeah. do you spend your time? Yeah, I think we're very normal people, I, I guess. Uh, so f speaking for myself, so, well, I I love my job and I spend a lot of time with my job, but I like other things as well. I i am into sports. I'm into long distance running. I spend time at the gym. I also spend time in restaurants and bars. I uh, play the piano. So I do very normal things. I also go to museums. I think things that everybody hopefully can enjoy. So you play the piano. When, we're, when are we having the next concert by Henrik Leopold at KLU? Well, I'm not sure I'm good enough, right? So it's, I spend a lot of time as childhood playing the piano. I, I, I do have a nice piano in my living room, but that's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't feel I'm ready for a concert. But it's something I enjoy. And I think this is, uh, this is important that you have a couple of things in life besides the job that you can enjoy. Of course. Then let's focus again in what you are good at, which that is <laughs> researching. Um, let's talk a little bit about your research. Your research area at the moment is mainly process mining. When reading this term, all I could think about is the Minecraft. I don't know. I guess it's because the name is similar and I'm sure that has nothing to do with it. So for us that we're not so techy, can you summarize in simple words what is process mining about? Yeah, I think the mining relation is not bad. So I think the, the idea of process mining is that in an organization, there is lots of data. People do their work and while doing their work, you leave traces. So if you write an email, you leave traces. If you use a system for communication, for ordering things, whatever you do in your job, you leave traces. And these digital traces, they can be used to reconstruct how people uh, conduct work, how the organization works. And that is something that can be used to analyze and improve how the organization works. And that is something that, that's, that's something what I do. And I, I think it's very exciting because the data is there, but it hasn't been used for a long time. And um, yeah, as you know, most organizations are interested in improving operations and getting better in somewhere the other way. Everybody likes to improve the processes in their workplace to make them more efficient, also the workers. So I imagine that's a little bit where it's leading to. The idea is to um, use the data that is there to understand in the first place what's happening. And you have to see that improving always sounds a bit negative, right? So it sounds a bit like, yeah, consultants are coming and improving uh, and people don't have a positive connotation with that typically. But we have, for instance, to give you an example, we have worked in hospitals and uh, we have helped hospitals to deliver better care. And better care means that uh, they can improve the health of their patients better, faster, and also maybe that the people that are working at hospital can go home on time. So these these are more maybe positive aspects of this notion of improvement and optimization. That kind of responds my next question, which was going to be, so what is the final goal? What is that thing that you would say, okay, if I have achieved this, then I've done well with my research? Yeah, so I think that technology should be there to help people. Yeah, and when I talk about organizations, it always sounds abstract, but technology can help people 
And uh, my goal and my ambition is that we can use algorithms and technology to make people's lives better. It sounds a bit cheesy maybe, but I think that is something that we can accomplish in that direction in, in different ways. We go back to the teaching part because um, we could be talking about your research for two hours probably. <laughs> And one can be a great researcher, but that doesn't make you a good teacher. And by receiving the best teacher award this year, as a teacher, you're definitely doing something good. Who teaches you to be a good teacher? It's a very good question because um, I, I have received some formal education on it, uh, mostly during my stay in the Netherlands. But I think from the style and how I approach teaching, it's it's a bit a little bit of inspiration I got when I was a student. So when I was at university, at Humboldt University, I liked the professors that were really passionate about it, right? So they are they're simply individuals and for some reason they dedicated their lives to topics such as databases. But they are so passionate about that that is inspiring. And this is something I, I really, really liked to be really into the topic and and convey this yeah, this atmosphere. So I think I draw a lot of inspiration from from the good teachers or from what I found a good teacher back then. And besides being passionate, there was also dedication, being a bit, you know, flexible. When students have a question, be there, not ignore everything. And, you know, be nice once in a while. <laughs> I think that helps. <laughs> so passion and dedication are your superpowers as teacher. And what is the biggest challenge though? So I think teaching technical subjects that kill you my biggest challenge is that the level of knowledge that people have differs so some people when i when they come to my class they already know things about programming or databases and some people really don't and i want to teach everybody something i don't want anybody to be bored so those who already know things have to be entertained but i also really want everybody to keep up because i really think that I have a strong responsibility for those students that chose to join this technical track, that they also really learn something. And I think that is one of the, the bigger challenges. So you're facing these challenges with what well, I was mentioning, your superpowers. But do you have some days that you go home and you're like, wow, today was impossible. Like, how are those tough days? How can you overcome a difficult day in class? I think that happens. Um, and well, part of my job is being a very analytical person, right? So if things go wrong, um, I will probably ignore it for a day or two and then I will think about it and try to reflect, okay, what happened? What, what was it that was not good? Was it too complicated? Was it too long? Was I talking for too long time or was I too fast? There, there are so many reasons or, you know, maybe the students were, um, were already stressed out because of exams. I mean, there might be so many reasons. And yeah, I think that's what I do. And you go on. I think that I think you get used to these moments over time that it happens once in a while. I'm going to scratch a little bit the surface to yeah. for the people to get to know you better, people who are not a KLU. And I would like for you to share either one of the funniest moments that you had in class or or and one of the moments that you felt the most proud, either of yourself or of some students? Well, proud for me. So I think one of my personal success moments when I was teaching at Humboldt University, I had to teach the bachelors, but it was 300 students. So it was a big hall, 300 students. It was the first time I had to do this. And I was, yeah, I can say I was scared. And Feeling like a rock star, Lady you, Gaga in front of the crowd, huh? You do feel like a rock star, but then, you know, there's this crowd. And unfortunately, the crowd does not necessarily react to me like they would do to Lady Gaga <laughs> when a rock star. Uh, so, yeah, you have to entertain the crowd. And this is something you have to learn. And for me, one of the, I think what I really found so interesting for myself is that you really can grow into this. So after I did this two or three times, I was not scared anymore. I was starting to enjoy this and I was getting better and I could notice, okay, how do you entertain a crowd of 300 people? And I think that would really made me proud. I was very young at the time. I was just 21 or 22. 
um, to, to be able to do this. It, it somehow made me proud. It was not a particular accomplishment, but you know, this, is, this was some of the, that I perceived as a really, really big challenge. Comes to your mind any funny moments? Funny moments. Well, I'm not sure. It, f funny is two perspectives, right? So is it funny for the students or is it funny for myself? But I, I totally had moments where I where I had to head off the room because I felt I, I, I feel sick. I had a situation where I put up a slide and I really truly forgot what I wanted to talk about. So I, I look at it and after some time decide I will skip over it. But I mean, if you do it immediately, it might be okay, right? But if you look at it for a moment and I think these things happen, I think they're funny for the students. I also had, uh, you know, sometimes you have intel from the inside. So I once gave a lecture at the University of Mannheim as a guest lecture, and I had some some older slides that included uh, some, you know, old fashioned clip arts. So the the young students won't know what I'm talking about, uh, <laughs> but and those students knew what it is, and they immediately recognized that it's something completely old fashioned. And at the time, I didn't consider it, and I only received that information because students obviously talked about it in some chats, and I had uh, someone on the inside to to tell me. But so I somehow was surprised and maybe also a little bit embarrassed so that I should probably update my figures. <laughs> that is wonderful. It's <laughs> a great snippet there of uh, the difficulties of being a teacher and a millennial too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you are now here at KLU in the heart of Hamburg, but your life runs as a pendulum between Berlin and Hamburg. What does Hamburg have that Berlin doesn't? So I always perceive Hamburg as uh, much more relaxed as Berlin. So it seems people are slightly happier here. It's a bit funny, but whenever I come here, I feel, and I go running, for instance, the cars don't honk that much. The people are a bit more relaxed. So this is something I do notice. Maybe it's having so much water around. We're just more chill. Yes, I, I don't know. I mean, the cliche is that Berlin is so exciting, but maybe Berlin is too exciting for the Berliners themselves and they get overexcited. I get you. Well, we're going to wrap the interview, but uh, in important learning, we always like to end with some piece of advice. A good number of our listeners may be thinking about starting soon their bachelor's or the master program. What would you tell them? What is a life lesson that when you look back, you will love that you have received when you were in that spot and you didn't and now you know better. Yeah, so how do you decide? So I think for me, I basically had something I liked, right? At the time it was uh, computer science and I just followed that path. If I had to really think, okay, is this going to be the passion of the rest of my life? How can you know, right? So I, and I think in hindsight, That was a good thing to do. You have to just start with something and well, you should like that something at least a little bit, I guess. But I think if you, if you keep on thinking and insisting, oh, okay, I have to wake up in the morning. This is going to be the thing I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I think this is a hard decision. You can get stuck in that decision moment sort of. And for me, it was choose something you like and follow that path. If you happen to like something else on the way, I, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a way. I, I have a friend who's a doctor and only after becoming a doctor decided to be a computer scientist. Life is, you know, not that linear in that sense. So I think pick something that you like and, and follow that path. And eventually there will be very nice opportunities to, you know, have a career or do whatever you find important for your life. So follow your passion. And if you don't have clear your passion, then start with what you like. And you'll figure out if that's your passion. And if not, just redirect. It's completely fine. Thank you for that great tip. And thank you also for this nice time sitting with us in this podcast. It was great to be here. Thank you. We leave it here and we'll be soon again with you bringing to your homes more capturing stories in our next episode of Import and Learning Kelly Stories. Until then, receive a warm greeting from who has been on this side of the waves, Christopher Estegar in the technical side, Nicole Martinet in the production, and I'm Patricia Mandala. Take care and keep your brain moving. Cheers.
discover Kuna Logistics University in Hamburg, Germany. Learn more about their offered business and supply chain management study programs at the-klu.org.